Mental care, yeah, also. Well, that's, that's massively uh, undervalued, but that's all across Europe, isn't it? And yeah. it's, it's so sad. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the work that they do is, well, I think if more people went to a counsellor mm -hmm. before they hit rock bottom, yeah. just to talk about their views to someone who doesn't know them, yeah. um, could make a difference. But, you know, we clearly have a class system in the UK, but it feels like. Yeah, I do see that. Yeah, for sure. I don't think the class system ever disappeared. We, we strive toward that point where it would disappear, um, where everybody would gain the same access, you know, class-wise or, or money-wise or, or opportunity-wise. I don't think we ever got there. I think we're now giving up before we, you know, achieve it. Um, and I, 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 of course, I have to say that I do admit uh, I, I admire, you know, I admire our society and, and the Scandinavian welfare system and that whole model of society. It's a really good way of, of you know, trying to, to make everybody feel, you know, that they have an equal right to participate in everything. Um, and it's really a shame that we're now moving in some ways, uh, more and more moving away from that. Because we, we're not the only ones in the world to con consider ourselves you know, unique with this welfare system. Because basically the whole world considers that to be really unique. So why are we moving away from it? A lot of p politicians today, are, are Sylvie Modig is one of them, um, are raising their voices uh, saying that, that we, we can't afford welfare. We're just prioritizing the wrong things, basically. Because we're prioritizing really short-sightedly. And, and not, we're not trying to plan ahead and see what effects all of these cuts will have in 10 years or 15 years. And once we're there, how, how much more expensive is it going to be to rebuild again? The big silence. Uh, you mentioned that you, as a child, you had a lot, of, a lot of opportunities, but you didn't know how to go after them. Yeah, I so mean, theoretically, I had yeah. opportunities, yeah. Um, but what happened in your mind that you realized I need to change something? I became a father, basically. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what did it, I think. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't, you know, my childhood wasn't one of, of extreme suffering, mm -hmm. anything like that. I had sort of a happy childhood. It was, you know, terse and it was difficult economically and, and with the constant threat of poverty and losing work and stuff like that and but but yeah what what happened was that i just i i felt myself needed to to change my life path because of my kids and the future of my kids that's what made it i think and, you and, and yes when i said that i, I had opportunities mm -hmm. um, i had the same theoretical opportunities as mm -hmm. everybody else in finland um, to study to move w where i want to do what i want uh, but when you grow up in the, within the kind of context I did, um, it's not easy to see all that. It's not easy to go after all that because you're really used to seeing things just not working out. Uh, you're, uh, well, I'm not, not going to generalize. I'm going to speak about myself just only. Um, I, I grew up with seeing that um, the efforts of my parents to shape their lives were they, it wasn't working out. They just couldn't make it. Uh, they couldn't do what they wanted to do, what they had a passion for doing. They were just forced from one um, low-paid job into the other, into the other, into the other, without you know, being able to want what they did. 
but they, they were forced into doing what they did. Um, so that's what I grew up with. And yes, theoretical opportunities I had, but to gain access to them and to, to go after them needs examples for me to follow. It needs some kind of inner strength that I felt I didn't have until I you know, became a father. And that was then my driving force to change my circumstances. So what, what do you think would be needed in our society to break that pattern that you just described that your family had when you were a kid? A lot of things. Just um, name some. Yeah, I, a couple of things pop into my mind. Um, well, first of all, strong um, networks for social work um, and big budgets for social work um, and the kind of social work that not just in, in Swedish, there's this term called upsek and the I don't know if, if anybody knows the English term for that. Anna? No? Okay. Well, it, it's the kind of work where you don't see that in your office, you know, just looking at blankets and filling them out and stuff like that. Um, no, not blankets, I mean sheets of paper. Uh, blanket, Swedish. Um, but, but the kind of social work where you actually actively seek out the people who are in need. Um, you seek out um, people who are suffering from, you know, whatever. It might be illness, it might be mental illness, might be, you know, poverty, might be um, addictions or, or violence, you know, domestic violence. Um, and for, for the representatives of the authorities to have the time and be able to go out and seek these people and to bring them in. That's what's needed. Um, not only for, for social workers working with uh, grown-ups and parents and stuff like that, but also um, youth workers. Um, um, and there are a few in, in Helsinki that are, that are doing this, actually going to the people who, who they feel need their presence and then to try to bring them into some kind of meaningful structure um, and into a place where they can be told about opportunities to change their lives if they have the will to change their lives. Um, and all of this, it really costs money. Um, but that's part of the welfare system, I think. And it should be that way. And, and I'm, I'm concerned that we're just, you know, not prioritizing that. And, and I, I really feel that we don't see the full effects of that happening. Uh, I really appreciated your uh, connection to transformation. Yeah. And then uh, you'll have to forgive me because I am from the US yeah. and I didn't get your neoliberalism connection. And that is, uh, that I have to, I'll admit it, that's foggy for me here in Finland. I've been here a couple of years and I keep running into that wall. Mm. I don't understand why I sound like a right winger when I'm talking about change and tr personal transformation. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's a long discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, no, it's all right. I just have to see if I can articulate my thoughts about this. Um, to be able to do this, I should really switch to Swedish, but that might be a problem, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know if I have a vocabulary for it in English. I'm sorry. That's fair. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'd tell you to read my book, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just use that as an excuse. <laughs> is, is there an English trans translation coming up? Uh, not, not as far as I know. Yeah. I'm really sorry about this. I, should, I would love to talk about it, but, but perhaps another day, another time. Yeah. Well, I, can, I think I have a lot of voice. Uh, yeah, it's for, for the yeah, okay. The device. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was just curious, kind of this writing thing. Uh, was it always for you kind of a um, way of escaping, escaping kind of this shit, what you were talking about? Or did it kind of accidentally came then? After well, like quite adults, quite accidentally, really. Mm -hmm. I didn't uh, long for that as a kid or as a teenager or even mm -hmm. as a young adult. Mm -hmm. um, I started studying literature at university because um, 
before I started that, I was doing my civil service here in Helsinki. Uh, I just moved from Vasa after, after um, upper secondary school, Lukia, um, to do my civil service here. And during that year, um, I was a janitor at a school for that year, for my civil, civil service. Uh, and my friend from Vasa lived close by that, my workplace. And she often came to visit me and we just, you know, had talks and we drank coffee and, and stuff like that. Um, and she was at that time studying literature at the university here. Um, and she told me a lot about her studies that it seemed, you know, it's for her fascinating and fun and you can have a lot of interesting discussions and debates and you can write about stuff. And, and I thought it sounded pretty okay, you know, pretty fun. Um, but then on top of that, she said that it's the one, you know, course uh, in the whole of the Helsinki University that, that was easiest, easiest to get into. Um, and that was of course attractive to me, so I went for it. Um, and I got in. Um, and then I thought, uh, up to that point I had thought about perhaps studying psychology. Um, I was interested in photography. And I even considered being a baker, to you know, bake bread and stuff. Um, but yeah, so I thought, well, I'll give, I'll give literature a year or something and then I can change my major if I feel like it. But it was really interesting and it was really fascinating studies and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and then I just made a decision to continue with that, to stick to it. Um, and that was my, you know, I had, of course, I'd, I had read books before that and I had been interested in, in, in philosophy and stuff like this. Um, that I gained entry into um, in, in upper secondary with my philosophy courses and psychology courses and things like that. Um, but yeah, so I didn't, you know, I didn't start writing until really late in my life. I started writing when I was 26 or 27 or some uh, late in my life. Sounds like I'm 80 or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, you get the idea. Um, so yeah, I started dabbling with words, uh, writing really shitty poetry first. Um, then writing short stories, um, and my my first contact to my to my um, to the publisher that's now published my book was through a collection of short stories that I wrote um, that were completely fictional. I thought um, so. It wasn't autobiographical. I wasn't writing about myself. Um, but after I had sent off this short story book or collection, I read a Swedish writer writer called Christian Lundberg. And that just turned everything completely upside down for me. Um, and I still that, that his authorship and his books, um, they've completely changed what I perceive writing to be. Um, it's also changed, sort of changed, um, or partly changed what I perceive reading to be. So he was a really important writer to me. Um, and I read his auto-fictional books about poverty and mental illness and, you know, suburbia and stuff like that. So I really felt the connection there. Um, and through his books, I felt for the first time that I do have a right to speak about these things. Um, and yeah, I hadn't planned on doing this, but perhaps I'll just do it. Um, I celebrated my first book last year by get it, getting my first tattoo here on my leg. <laughs> there. Um, it says, Om jag inte berättar förlora jag. Um, that's basically, um, if I don't write, I will lose. And that's what I felt. If I don't, you know, go after this thing that I feel rising up within me, I'm, I, I'm going to lose part of myself in some strange way. Did so I answer your question? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have two, two last questions. Uh, Hi, Thank you very much for this morning. I'm interested to know if your book was received negative, uh, you know, poorly or negatively in certain circles in Finland. Like, have you have you received criticism for coming out and speaking out as you have? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah a lot of it. Um, yeah, there's been both really good good reviews, good critique, and positive response, but also a lot of you know negative and and, and quite angry response and angry reviews and critique. Um, which is really a good thing because the the dynamics of the discussion about the book after it was published uh, worked really much by people say people saying something really good about it, and immediately somebody would say something negative about it, commenting on the positive, and then somebody else would comment the negative by saying something positive. So it just went on and on like this, and it was a real discussion you know, in the media, both in Finnish and Swedish, 
and there was a deba debate about it, which I was really glad about. But, but the people who have been harshest have been really harsh. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a young Kokomus politician <laughs> who wrote a long, really angry um, blog post about, not the book, but he, he had apparently read the interview that Helsinki Sanomat made with me and published, and he was clearly very upset. And the, the title of the blog post was uh, Vitun Kevihat. <laughs> basically, that shut the fuck up. Why are you whining about your life, basically? Um, so yeah, there was a lot of you know, harsh words about it, but it, I, I really don't mind, because I'm just glad that people have, people, a lot of people have felt the need to position their, their themselves uh, toward the themes I described. And that's always a good thing. Hi, <clears throat> I I don't know if this is a is a is a really a question, but um, myself having grown up in kind of a well, I would call it like an upper middle class bubble where all my parents and grandparents and and their parents had been university educated, and and by the age of five, it was in my head that I will go to university, and and figure stuff out. Um, it's really easy to forget and, and not to realize that this kind of still exists in Finland and, and when you live in a sort of small area in, in Helsinki. Um, so that it's really uh, sort of refreshing to hear this. And, and uh, sort of a good reminder and, and to realize, and I have a lot of friends who sort of share um, all my peers that sort of had the same um, starting point and had the opportunities and, and maybe had the encouragement and the resources to to pursue them. Um, but I think it's it's really good to hear this and, and sort of spring up the discussion and um, make also these other people realize that they are quite quite fortunate and they maybe should appreciate that and, and try to help other people as well. Thank you. Okay, okay, the last one. Last, last, last one. Thank you. Um, I could really identify what you said about the um, history and um, and I realized that um, I also come from that sort of background uh, where my parents and the people around me just didn't see that much future. And it's just amazing to meet these other kind of uh, family backgrounds, how influential it is that um, you have people who say that, you know, dream big you can achieve it. Yeah. What was said uh, silently, not out loud, silently, the message uh, where I come from is that, you know, it's not worth even trying. And what changed for me, because now I'm very, very pri privileged in my life, what changed is that, um, first of all, I moved, <laughs> I left, and, uh, and I changed a lot of things in my life. And, 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 and why I describe my life as a privilege these days is not about money or stuff like that. It's more like um, that I created an, a support network for myself. Now I'm surrounded with people who have this very deep uh, feeling that, you know, we can do it if we just want to, um, with, with, with a hint of reality, of course. Um, and uh, that was uh, what I was lacking, but uh, that's, that's what I had to create for myself. And that is a long, long journey. So what we can do here, um, not just for each other, but we all have these people who have this feeling inside of them that I'm not worth it. I'm not worth of, you know, achieving, trying to achieve something. So, you know, what we can do as a result of this morning, is to try to recognize that, that sort of thing. I'm surrounded with people who look good for the outside, but inside they have this feeling that, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm worth of, 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 of trying to achieve my goals, for example. So, yeah, coming from the background where, 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 where my English teacher said that, you know, I'm not worth of uh, trying to, you know, worth of um, her teaching. And my parents had to hire me a private teacher. I don't know how they did it, but they, they did it anyway. So, um, you know, being the person who's um, obviously speaking English today. So it's like, 
weird shit happens, like these small, small, small things in our, you know, equal society. So we are privileged here, and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I like what you said about feeling unworthy. Unworthy. I don't think we should underestimate how powerful and restrictive that feeling is of feeling unworthy of change, unworthy of something better, better, un unworthy of having people help us when we need it. Um, that feeling is really isolating and it's, it's really hard to get out of a situation like that when you've been raised up in it perhaps or you have that in your background, you have that in you know, your, your family dynamics or, or whatever. So yeah, it's, let's not underestimate it. Could I say something about the neoliberal thing? I just... <laughs> I feel I need to, yeah. Well, I think uh, partly what, what people are, are reacting to when, when they speak like this to you, when you speak about them, whatever, is that I think the, the whole, your whole outset as a an, as an North American, and particularly then um, from the United you know, States, um, is how to say this so that you can understand. Uh, I'm not meaning that you're all stupid, just that I can't articulate it properly. Uh, but I know it's, it's the kind of thing that um, I'm thinking of uh, Francis Fukuyama, for instance. He wrote the, the End of History and all that, where he proclaimed the, you know, the, the, the free market, the democratic free market economy, that kind of society to be the absolute you know, high point of human civilization. Um, and I think this is what, what America is, what North America is today. Um, and, and Fukuyama, he, was, you know, he went to university with, with uh, Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz. And these ideal, ideologues for you know, what became the Reagan administration. And that kind of economical change to Reagan and that, Thatcher, that's what I feel is the core of neoliberalism. And, and that's, I think, kind of ubiquitous within the North American context today. So to be able to differentiate that from other things and, and, and being able to break away from that because it's all, so all over. Like, you know, in media with Fox News and stuff like that, it's, it's becoming what Michel Foucault was talking about when he spoke about discourse and, and you know, you're, you not seeing your discourse and being unable to break out of it. It's perhaps that kind of a thing, that the, your outset is sort of neoliberal, uh, the ideology and the, the free market thinking that perhaps you're not, you're not personally that invested in, but that's your context. And when you share stuff from your context, it's going to be interpreted like this. So that's partly what I was thinking of. But that's, that's a long discussion. <laughs> Continue. Thank you for sharing. It's 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 amazing to see kind of already what happens in this room uh, without with kind of being open and, and 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 sharing your own experiences. Already we had people telling about their own experiences, and that's that's kind of that's that's amazing to to experience and, and amazing to see. Maybe my lesson of today is something we all we, everybody can get a grasp of. Reclaim your life. It's not always easy. It's never easy, <laughs> let's say like this. It's never easy. But it's doable.